Please pray with me. Lord God, our Redeemer, who heard the cry of your people and sent your servant Moses to lead them out of slavery, free us from the tyranny of sin and death, and by the leading of your Spirit, bring us to our promised land. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, the reading I want to focus on today is from Job chapter 42, verses 1 to 6 and 10 to 17. So they split it up a little bit. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep. 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. And this Job lived for 140 years. Sorry, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the, our reading from Job is from the very, very end of Job, it's that sort of tail end summation. Um, some of the books in the Bible are designated as wisdom literature. Um, Job is a part of that wisdom literature. Uh, the most obvious book in that des- that has that designation as wisdom literature is the book of Proverbs. It is about living life wisely. Uh, Proverbs is a book that gives guidance, general guidance about how to live life well. Uh, it's advice that's given from Uh, observation and meditation on kind of cause and effect, what generally happens in our life. Um, So for example, uh, Proverbs 10 verse 4 says, A lack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. And so generally that's true. If you work hard, you are more likely to be financially prosperous. The prophets will often talk about God's protection for those who are obedient to the commands of God. And disaster for those who are disobedient to God's law. So, for example, this is another cause and effect thing. For example, Deuteronomy 28 reads, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I will give you today the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Right? So that's uh, 28 verse 1. So if you obey the commands that are given, then the nation will do well. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. That's 28 verse 15. So there's this idea of um, follow the commands, things will go well for you. If you don't follow the commands of God, then these bad things will happen, you know, which is a very similar kind of idea that we find in, the, in Proverbs as well, right? So these, follow this general advice and things will go well for you. Um, Verses like this paint a pretty clear picture. Um, 
we all know, but we all know that that's not the way that life always goes, right? Sometimes uh, there are lots of people who work hard and they don't end up being financially prosperous. Um, there's some people who work hard all their life and then all of a sudden something happens with their company, goes bankrupt, they lose their pension. Uh, we have put some, some things in, in place to try to prevent that now, but it wasn't so long ago that, you know, within living memory, this, this happens to people. So there are people who don't match this, um, this sort of clear image of do good and good will happen to you, do bad and bad will happen to you. There are people who live very faithfully who endure great tragedy. We've known these people within our congregation. Um, there are parts of the Bible that recognize this reality too. So the, the, the Bible isn't uniform it's in its voice saying do good and good will happen to you. It has a conversation uh, in, in the text of scripture. There are parts of the Bible that recognize that it's more complicated, even though it's generally good advice. So within the Bible, we see a kind of dialogue happening. Uh, we hear a voice saying, do good, good will happen to you, do bad, bad will happen to you. And so that's the general advice. But we also hear a voice that recognizes that sometimes those who do good have bad happen to them, and sometimes those who do bad have good happen to them, <laughs> the wicked prosper. The book of Job is a part of this conversation. The book is probably written something like a parable. So, um, you know, even though maybe there was a, a, a Job that was kind of the um, inspiration for this story, um, I, I don't think that we need to take this as a historical story. I think it's more of a story like a parable. Um, it's a story to help us reflect on the dilemma of being good and having bad happen to us. It, so it complicates this simplistic idea that if you are good, if you do good, then you will have good happen to you. And that's a guarantee all the time. Right? It's, it, the book of Job complicates that simplistic idea. And like a parable, to understand Job, I think it's important that we, we consider the story as a whole. I don't think it's always all that helpful to just preach on pieces of Job. I think we have to look at it as a whole. And the story goes something like this. Job is morally good, very prosperous. He is about as good as a human being can get. He lives in a big house. He has lots of land. He has a big family, lots of possessions. Job loves God. He's a good guy. And he turns away from evil. So he is he is not doing evil things, he is faithful to God, and his life is prosperous and beautiful and good. And God richly blesses Job with family and property. God even brags to Job about the Satan, and the Satan means the accuser um, or the adversary. He's something like uh, a court prosecutor where he's kind of collecting evidence against human beings. Satan looks at Job after God kind of directs his attention there and he tells God, yes, he's good. Job is good. But what happens if you take away his blessings? He's only good because you keep rewarding him for it. Of course he's going to be good. What happens when you take away his reward for being good? Do you think he's still going to be good? I doubt it. I actually think he's going to curse you right to your face if you take away his blessings. So this is Satan's question for God. How do you know Job really loves you? Maybe he just loves the rewards that you're giving him. Would, would Job still be good without the rewards? So many children are taught to do the right thing through rewards and punishments. Um, but there is a point in their moral maturity when we trust that they will choose to do the right thing without the rewards or the punishment. We would be disappointed if our children grew up and would only do good if there was some personal reward for them. Right? That's, they have not morally matured at that point. So in this parable, Job becomes a kind of test case. What will Job do when his rewards for being good are taken away? God allows Satan to take away Job's rewards. And there's an awful and horrible catastrophe. And it not only destroys his possessions, but it destroys his children. Um, and Job is inflicted with painful sores all over his body. 
Job has no clue why any of this has happened to him. It doesn't make any sense to him. Suffering that makes sense is easier to deal with. Suffering as a consequence of a dumb decision that I made, um, it, it's easier to deal with because it makes sense. It's like, ah, oh, I did this stupid thing. Okay, and that's why I'm suffering now, <laughs> right? I made this mistake, and now I'm suffering the consequences for it. Or suffering that is like connected to, the, to labor that delivers a baby, the pregnant woman that goes through the suffering of labor. That's easier to deal with because there's, there's a point to the suffering. There is a meaning around, behind the suffering. There's a cause for the suffering. Job wants suffering to make sense. Suffering that, we, that makes sense, that has a reason, is easier to deal with. So Job wants to understand what is the reason that will make sense of my suffering. Job stands as a representative of humanity and is tested without knowing it. Can a human being love God without being rewarded? Can a human being do what is right when there is no personal benefit? So the test has begun. Job's friends sit with him in mourning for seven days without saying anything. But then they try to help him understand what's happening. If this doesn't make sense, then it's troublesome to them too, right? If Job is suffering, then the world kind of doesn't make sense. And so these friends want to find a way to make sense of this situation. They cannot believe that God would allow this to happen without having a very good reason for it. And so they start doing theology. And so one suggestion that, hap- that they come up with is that Job has some awful secret sin that he is being punished for. And what he needs to do is confess this sin and ask for forgiveness for it. But we know that that's not the case with Job from reading the beginning of Job, right? Job knows that he doesn't have some heinous hidden sin that is buried in his life somewhere that would account for the suffering, for for, for all that's happened to him. I think every one of us can relate to Job at some point in our life. We endure some sort of tragedy or illness or uh, we lose a loved one and we ask why. We try to make sense of it. And sometimes we try to find natural ways to explain the thing that has happened to us. You know, am I sick because of a consequence of an incompetent healthcare practitioner? They made some sort of mistake. They didn't give me advice they should have given me. Um, maybe I should have been more careful with what I ate. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I made a mistake. Uh, maybe there's a contaminant in the water or in the air that explains why I'm suffering this way or I have this disease. Should I have taken better care of my body? Um, maybe I should have been drinking cranberry juice, you know, like some sort of nutrient or, or natural remedy that I should have been taking. We can sort of have these natural ways of trying to understand why this thing is happening to me, this physical ailment. Um, in the book of... Uh, we sometimes have... Um, spiritual reasons for trying to explain what's happening to us. And so sometimes we'll have a child get sick or, or something else will happen to us, some sort of tragedy, and we, we wonder, did I do something? Did I not pray enough? Um, was it because of some sin in my life? Is this suffering because of the consequence as some sin? Um, or is it someone else's sin that I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of on the outskirts of and I'm feeling the consequences of it? Is God punishing me for something? Um, people will go golfing and if they, if, if it goes well, you know, they have some good, some good drives, people will say, well, you must be living right, right? And the idea there is that you're golfing well, it's like you're lucky, right? You're, you're living well. Meaning, like you're being, re- that was a reward for you living well, right? And um, it's a very weird thing that we do. And we, we think about this when it comes to karma, this idea of, of there being always a really good cause and effect understanding of what's happening to us. Well, the book of Job complicates this kind of simplistic thinking. If I do good, good will happen to me. If I do bad, bad will happen to me. It holds up... Th- it complicates that by holding up these two questions. On the one hand, we have Satan asking the question, can people love God without being showered with rewards for their good behavior? 
So without the rewards, can people love God and be good? Satan is saying that people will only love God and be good if there's a reward. Without rewards of property and family and good health, people will not love God and do good. So Satan is basically saying that their good behavior is essentially selfish. They will only do good if they're going to get something out of it. On the other hand, we have Job's question. Is it right for God to let people suffer who love him and who do good? These are good people who love God. How can God, who is good and all-powerful, watch one of his children who loves him suffer and not do something about it? And you can see how with both those, you can't answer, it's a conundrum. Right? Because if God always rewards it, then there, there will never act. There's a possibility that people will only love him because of the rewards. Right? So this is a conundrum, this is a tension. And the book of Job rests in this tension. Right? It, it never really resolves these things. It rests in a mystery. But out of that mystery comes a response. Um, as we endure through this undeserved suffering, how do we speak about God? How do we speak to God? Throughout the book, Job expresses his anger to God. He expresses his frustration. He questions. He demands answers. Uh, but he never curses God. Um, his wife says this, right? She says, curse God and die. And he doesn't do that. Right? He never turns his back on God. In fact, he's the only human being in the book who speaks directly to God. The friends theologize and try to find a way to make Job's suffering make sense. But Job brings his pain to God. He brings his confusion to God. He maintains his gaze on God in the midst of his suffering. In response to Job's demands for an explanation from God, God shows up in a whirlwind. And this is kind of like a mystical vision that Job is now having. And God questions Job about the mysteries of creation. And Job is dumbstruck by this vision. Um, Job has a mystical encounter with God. Previously, he had heard of God. Now he sees God. And in seeing God and hearing his response, Job is transformed in a mysterious way. But he's also left speechless. His time for crying out in anger at God has ended when he encounters his creator. He realizes how much he doesn't understand. And he can only respond with silence. God then turns from Job to speak to Job's friends. The friends who are defending God and accusing Job of having some secret, hidden, awful sin. And God says that Job um, must pray for the friends. or God basically gives them trouble. Right? <laughs> um, God says this. My wrath is kindled against you. This is to the friends. You have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. They're the ones that were defending God and trying to say that it must be Job who did something wrong because it, God wouldn't do this without Job having some awful sin in his life. And God then asks the friends to ask Job to pray for them. Job prays for his friends, and then God blesses Job once again with family and doubles the wealth he had before. So no answer is given to Job. The reason for his suffering is never given. We will find no easy explanation for our sufferings in this book. What we will find is words to speak to God in our suffering. The friends who attempt to give an explanation for Job's suffering are the ones who are told in the wrong. Job's crying out to God in anger and pain, bringing his pain to God, that is what God accepts. And God says, Job spoke rightly of me. The ending of Job is not sort of a happily ever after and everything's okay tied up in a nice little bow. It's an ending. It, and it is not a, a naive return to the beginning of the book as if dead children can be replaced by new living children. That is not the, 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 the answer, that is not the message that Job is trying to get. But it is trying to say that there is an ending and it's saying that 
we can come out of suffering on the other side after wrestling with, with God. And in Job's life and in our life, suffering will not have the last word. Suffering will not have the last word. It is a temporary reality that is awful to deal with, but it will have an ending. That's what Job's trying to say through this ending, that there is an ending. This story, this parable, is a response to the Proverbs and the prophets that declare that if you do right, then God, then, sorry, then good will happen to you, right? This idea that if you do good, then good will happen to you. If you do bad, bad will happen to you. This is a response to that kind of an idea. It's complicating that idea. It is not always the way that things go, as we are very aware. And when we find ourselves suffering for no obvious reason, we have Job as our companion. And in Job, we can see a reflection of Christ. His suffering, Christ's suffering, was not as simple as, if you do good, good will happen to you. If you do bad, then bad will happen to you. In his suffering, there was something happening that no one could comprehend. Christ was building something out of his suffering, which would become salvation for humanity. God has not abandoned us in our suffering. In Christ, he has joined us in our suffering. God does not sit off in the distance watching us suffer, saying, don't worry, one day it'll be okay. He joins us in, in all of the filth and all the dust and all the ashes, but he will not leave us there. God will not let suffering have the last word in God's good creation. Jesus will be with us in it, through it, bringing us out of it. He will descend into the grave with us and he will rise with us. Jesus sits with us in our pain and our suffering, but he is there to guide us out of our suffering as well. There is an end. Life does not end with a cross. The cross will lead to resurrection and life that does not end. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen.